Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Ceylon College of Physicians, you all are welcome to the sixth session of the new lecture series on peer learning, periphery to the four. Uh, this is an online case presentation by consultants away from the center. My name is Dr. Rohit Amaravitarana, the moderator of the today event. This is one hour session and two consultants present and discuss clinical cases. They share their experience with us. At the end of the both presentations, we will discuss the questions received from virtual participants. Please send your questions to Q&A box. Today, we have a consultant endocrinologist and a consultant general physician joining virtually from Nuareli and uh, Let me to introduce the first speaker today. Dr. Sonali Gunatilaka, MBBS Peradenia, MD Colombo, MD Gold Medal for the best performance, uh, overseas training at Oxford University and Cambridge University NHS Trust UK. Her special interest is bone related endocrine disorders and pituitary disorders. She contributed several guideline development projects, both nationally and internationally. She is an author for several peer review articles published in international journals and book chapters in endocrinology. Currently, she is a consultant endocrinologist working at District General Hospital, Nuaradia. She is going to, to present a medical case on back on the feet, an uncommon story. Over to you, Dr. Sonali. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the CCP and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk um, on the Peer Learning Forum, uh, Periphery 4. And uh, let me share my presentation. Um, OK, so um, I'm uh, planning to discuss about two cases. Um, quite quickly uh, and to emphasize on uh, the challenges, difficulties we face in the peripheries as well as to give some insight on a very rare, uh, uncommon presentations or uncommon uh, entities in endocrine diseases. Okay, let me start by the case one. So this is a 17 year old girl. I'm putting the pictures with consent. Um, she had been unable to walk for five years. Actually, when she came, my her mother was carrying the patient, although she was 17, and uh, she could not walk. So when I went into the history, there was delayed gross motor milestones, and there had been difficulty in walking through since childhood. But uh, she managed to walk with support, but gradually walking became very difficult. And she was chair or bed bound for more than five years. And um, she claimed of mainly muscular symptoms, especially myalgia, muscle pain, and severe muscle weakness, especially proximal more than distal. But there were no so other associated difficulty in breathing or swallowing or speech anomalies, which where the central muscle groups would be involved. And all the rest of the other um, home systems were normal as well as menstrual cycles were uh, normal and regular. So in the examination, um, she was short and her height was less than third centile. And you can appreciate, this is while the patient was uh, lying on bed. And uh, let me just pull up the laser pointer. Okay, so you can appreciate there is some leg deformity as well as severe muscle wasting in both legs. We call this um, wing wind swept deformity. So the legs are, uh, you know, deviated to one side, like in wind swept uh, deformity. And uh, so, and in the spine, there was scoliosis, muscle tone was reduced and muscle power was approximately two out of five, whereas distal four out of five and tendon reflexes were present and sensation, sensory uh, system was perfectly normal. Then we went on to invest for investigations, although she had been evaluated and treated here and there with a lot of defaults. Her blood full counts, ESR, 
were normal, although there were muscle uh, pain, CPK was normal. So as magnesium and calcium, it was marginally low, but more towards the normal side. But the significant one, we, the abnormally we found was low phosphate. Together with that, there was significantly high ALP levels. And vitamin D levels were also low, uh, but creatinine, the renal functions were normal. So there were there are a few major things that we could, I could uh, detect that was very high ALP, low phos, very low phosphate, and low vitamin D, and marginally low calcium levels. Okay, so this patient was initially treated as vitamin D deficient record, uh, record since age of uh, 10 years, uh, when she presented to the pediatrician uh, with these anomalies and difficulty in breathing, in um, walking, uh, because the vitamin D levels were found to be low throughout. She had been given vitamin D supplements, mega doses, as well as um, uh, regular doses, but uh, due to very difficult in, um, difficulties in purchasing vitamin D because it's not available in government sector and multiple defaults, uh, she was not fully treated or there was no uh, chance for the pediatrician to evaluate her properly. Uh, with a lot of investigations. So hyponatremia is a very significant cause for this uh, muscle problem and weakness. So my thoughts went through the differential diagnosis, what could cause this patient to have very low uh, phosphate levels. It could be trans transcellular shift, which could be a transient phenomenon. So uh, low phosphate levels can't persist in transcellular shift uh, the conditions where you get transcellular shifts. Uh, so periodically, if we do phosphate levels, it will become normal, low, so likewise variation. It could be due to reduced intake of phosphate, could be dietary deficiency or malabsorption. But unfortunately, this, this patient did not have any of these uh, features of malabsorption or any of the features suggestive of transient uh, transcellular shift. So my concern was mainly uh, targeted on whether is this patient excreting phosphate excessively. So it could be GI or renal. Uh, or since patient did not have any major GI pathology to detect with, uh, I was concentrating on renal pathologies, renal hyperphosphaturia um, as a possible cause for uh, hypophosphatemia in this patient. So you could see there are so many causes uh, of um, hy renal hypophosphaturia. And so I went one by one. But before going to that, having this thought of renal hypo hy hyperphosphaturia, I performed few other investigations, calcium uh, and phosphate, especially after optimizing vitamin D levels. I have treated her with vitamin D supplementations, mega doses followed by uh, large doses daily supplementation and then repeated all these investigations. Calcium became normal, lower margin, and phosphate still remained low. ALP slightly reduced, but still in the elevated, very much elevated range, and vitamin D had become normal after supplementation. Although vitamin D levels had been normal, she did not improve clinically at all. Then PTH levels, we arranged PTH. Unfortunately, we don't have PTH in um, can uh, no earlier. So I had to transfer the patient to uh, Candy to get the PTH levels. We, and it had to be a transfer because patient could not walk at all. And the patient parents could not afford a vehicle to Candy, although it's just um, 70 kilometers away. So those are the challenges. Although I wanted to do, it was difficult to get even the PTH level done. So why PTH? Because Hyperparathyroidism can cause similar picture of low phosphate, but mind you, that would result high calcium levels. This patient did not have high calcium levels and her PTH levels were normal. So hyperparathyroidism was excluded by PTH. And then we, I performed a special investigation series of investigations, paired serum phosphate creatinine and paired urine phosphate and creatinine to calculate her renal phosphate excretion. So fractionate 
phosphate excretion was 50.9 percent above 20 percent is thought high and that indicates that this patient is losing phosphate through her urine and all these investigations confirmed the calculations confirmed that she has renal phosphaturia so she's losing whatever the phosphate she takes through uh, the kidneys what are the you know, differential diagnosis for renal hyperphosphaturia so hyperparathyroidism was the initial the commonest one but having low normal calcium and normal pth excluded the possibility she was not on any medications to cause renal hyperphosphaturia and there was no gross renal pathology to cause any tubular defect grossly her scans were normal creatinine and ufr were normal then the problem came, is it kind of a Fanconi syndrome where proximal tubular defect is there, uh, which could be acquired. Uh, but this patient did not have any features of Fanconi like hypovolemia and the ABG was normal. There was no um, acid-based disturbance. Potassium was normal in this patient. Usually Fanconi's patients do have hypokalemia and she was not, uh, there was no association with heavy metals. Therefore, I thought, is were, was less likely. And vitamin D deficient T-recurs uh, was excluded because he never improved at all. So having the history of uh, symptoms since childhood, then that prompted me to think of any inherited cause such as vitamin D resistant or hypophosphatemic recurs. To diagnose this, we need ideal 125 GF20 um, in hormone and uh, both of them were not available and family history was not present in this lady, girl and uh, I could not have done I couldn't do any genetic uh, studies uh, here in New Orleans or even uh, um, in the country and patients could not afford that but I thought it was likely in this patient to have hypophosphatemic records okay so what happened in inherited hypophosphatemic records so if you concentrate on this um, picture, uh, PAX and DMP1 are the genes which are responsible for production of something called FGF23. So this green one is something called FGF23, which is a paracrine kind of a hormone. It's kind of a hormone which is responsible for phosphate balance in humans. Okay, FGF23 secreted from bones come and then act on the proximal tubule of the kidneys and they are responsible for titration or uh, handling the urine phosphate excretion. So usually urine, the phosphate in the urine is reabsorbed by the uh, sodium phosphate transporter. So usually what happens is phosphate is reabsorbed. FGF23 kind of suppresses this reabsorption. So, and it comes to a balance in normal physiology. Somehow, if this FGF23 is in excess due to many causes, it can block this reabsorption. Therefore, urine phosphate excretion will be high. Therefore, patient will have hyperphosphateuria. So, excess phosphate in the urine. Why? Because FGF23 is too much, which will block the reabsorption of phosphate. So any condition which can cause high FGF23 will do the, uh, will give rise to similar kind of a picture. So something like genetic mutations where these genes are mutated, they will produce a lot of FGF23 and that will cause hyperphosphaturia. It could be X-linked, autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant and increased FGF23 due to production from any other soft tissue tumors or problems in the sodium phosphate channel can give rise to hyperphosphatemic records. And clinically, they will have growth failure, short stature, skeletal deformities, and muscle weakness like in my patient. So what have I done? So the benefit, the most likely diagnosis was inherited form of a hyperphosphatemic records, given the clinical content. So I have started her with phosphate supplements. I started with Julie's phosphate, but unfortunately there was a time that the country did not have Julie's phosphate enough and we did not have in um, the hospital. So at one point I had to arrange uh, ambulance to go to LRH and uh, our pediatric endocrinologist kindly 
uh, gave us uh, some, some volume of uh, Julius phosphate, but that was not enough to persist because this patient depends on phosphate supplementation. Then um, I have tried Sandoz phosphate, which, which acted very markedly on her and she recovered tremendously and took it there with calcitriol. So this is how she is. She was after treatment. So you can appreciate she had been standing on her feet where she was uh, initially had been carried, out by, carried by this mother to the clinic. So that was a big achievement. And then although she was standing, you can still see her legs are deformed. The wind sweat deformity was there. So we had to monitor phosphate, PTH and ALP levels. That was a challenge because uh, monitoring PTH was difficult and without monitoring PTH, I could not, it, it was difficult to titrate calcitriol. Now, this is after treatment. The, you can see, appreciate the changes. Phosphate level has become normal and ALP is coming down, whereas PTH and calcium remains normal. So with treatment, this patient has improved markedly. And we did not stop there. You can appreciate that she, now she has undergone surgery. You can see the right leg is now straight. We have corrected it. There was a patch put by our brilliant orthopedic surgeons. They had to handle the patient very carefully because the bones are very fragile due to hypophosphatemia and the effects on bones. You can see the bones are very thin looking. Um, I, I did not do a DEXA scan on this patient, but now she is actually walking. I'm um, just trying to get a um, video. Yeah. You can see still how difficult it is for her to walk, but right leg is doing fine where the surgery was done. So um, now she is awaiting the second surgery for her uh, other leg. So challenges I faced in this patient was making the diagnosis was quite difficult because I did not have all the facilities where, in the, where we do diagnose abroad uh, like uh, genetics, 125 vitamin D, FGF 23. But with the available investigations, also it was a difficult task to get it done because my center did not have PTH or even urine calcium uh, assessment. Uh, so I had to transfer the patient to Candy to get the tests done. And uh, monitoring of the treatment was again difficult because PTH was not available. Uh, and availability of the phosphate was again a big task, big problem. And uh, actually one of uh, our kind donors have, have promised to supply Sandoz phosphate until there's a reasonable recovery for her. We are, he's ex kind of uh, uh, importing it from UK. So this patient is lucky to have uh, this and that would not come spontaneously. And we had to put a lot of effort and um, counseling and then uh, in, uh, to tell patient people to uh, get these donations. But final outcome, the patient is happy and uh, she's walking back on her feet. So this is where I work, the beautiful Neuralia Hospital. And then now I move on to the second case. This is a 34-year-old male who was previously perfectly fine. He presented with muscular pain, progressive weakness and difficulty in walking for six months. By the time he came, he was on crutches. So young man, young man coming in crutches is terrifying. So going into the history, he had musculoskeletal pain, especially back and axial. He again had proximal muscle weakness for two years, which was gradual onset, but progressive. But there were no more joint involvement, no precipitant factor, no family history and other systems are normal. Because of this back pain and um, musculoskeletal pain, he was evaluated by a rheumatologist for bilateral sacroiliitis. So these were the investigations done at rheumatologist. Basically, everything is normal. Again, ESR, CPK, normal. Calcium was marginal, but you can see, the, appreciate the ALP, 1,240, and the, it was mainly the bone isoform. So these tests were done by the rheumatologist, and a rheumatologist had, uh, again, run a few other tests to uh, exclude any proximal muscle weakness and sacroiliitis. So calcium, again, 
it was normal and there was one report of low phosphate um i'm not sure whether it was uh, picked up uh, quite well but uh, tsh was normal potassium was normal which could give rise to uh, proximal muscle weakness vitamin d was low bhla b27 was negative x rays showed unilateral sacroiliitis so as mri si joint so because of these some of these evidence are were suggestive and also the main complaint he had was back pain he was treated with vitamin d replacement for this vitamin d deficiency and two doses of iv infliximab was given but it was very correctly discontinued by the rheumatologist due to poor response therefore after that he was referred to us uh, because of this low vitamin d level and also low phosphate levels okay now we have another challenge uh, so when i so him there was no other fractures renal disease or diarrheal illness examination no skeletal deformities unlike in my previous patient tone was normal but there was significant proximal muscle weakness reflexes normal sensation was normal but i could not even examine the patient because it was so tender he was in pain because of the muscular skeletal pain and then uh, so again investigations at endocrine clinic lp high and low phosphate was again low in this patient pth was normal and dexa scan was done on this patient which showed a very very low bmd for his age so again i have a patient young previously healthy male with severe muscle weakness proximal more than distal and muscular skeletal pain with low phosphate and high lp normal calcium normal pth and having features of osteomalacia again like in the previous patient because there is no um, problems in dietary intake no transcellular shift no gi problems i concentrated on renal loss and did the calculations which showed similar results to previous patient high phosphate excretion in urine and renal phosphateuria because this patient was previously normal i assumed this is a quiet form of renal hypophosphateuria again back to basics going through the differential diagnosis and trying to find out what it is hyperparathyroidism was less likely because calcium pth was normal he was not on medications no renal pathology fanconi syndrome again was highly considered in this patient because it could be acquired but i could not find any feature uh, in this patient hiv could result in this kind of picture but it was negative and vitamin d levels are normal after some time but still patient had severe pain and weakness and actually towards the end of this evaluation patient was nearly um chair bound he could not go into the car it took about 1 hour for him to get into the car or get out of the car so it was that severe and then hypophosphatemic rickets in my like in my previous patients but there was no inheritance he was previously fine there was i thought it's less likely and then my uh, concentration was on an acquired cause whether is it tio that is tumor induced osteomalacia so you could see that in renal pathologies if we can exclude the congenital ones and the other other less likely causes you can see oncogenic osteomalacia or tumor induced osteomalacia is a is a is an acquired cause of renal hyperphosphatemia luckily this patient could afford unlike my previous patient although in the peripheries we talk about less facilities if we tell the importance this patient was willing to pay and then get these things done and these were not available in sri lanka we had to um arrange the samples to be sent out of the country and do this so 125 vitamin d levels were low and fgf level 23 levels were pretty high so i know that there's something producing fgf 23 in this patient which could give rise to renal hypophosphateuria giving all these symptoms but which what will produce this patient's fgf 23 so on further imaging skeletal survey showed multiple rib fractures both right and left side although he had no trauma it was spontaneous rib fractures probably due to low bone mass then since we had no clue or he had no symptom in his body to give any clue we went for a pet ct scan then found to have a mass in his ethmoidal air sinuses which was very vascular so this could be the reason which 
a mass producing FGF23, uh, which could result in all these symptoms. Okay, so the diagnosis was made as tumor induced osteomalacia. Initial treatment was the basics, replace the phosphate. So we used Sandoz phosphate and calcitriol, and then complete exception of the ethmoidal tumor uh, was performed by the ENT surgeon, and the histology came as phosphaturic mesenchymal tumor. And you can appreciate how he progressed. A young man who was about to be bed bound. We, with excision of this tumor and correct diagnosis, his phosphate, you can appreciate how the phosphate level has improved. ALP has become normal after one year. And then phosphate excretion had become normal even after one month of surgery. And then DEXA became normal. So DEXA and ALP takes time, but phosphate level becomes normal immediately in weeks, several weeks, sometimes in even one week. So this was a life change in this patient. Um, if not done, then he would have been in a great difficulty. So having the correct diagnosis does help the patients as well as save lives. So just a word about tumor-induced osteomalacia. We call TIO. It is a very rare uh, form of uh, diagnosis. And it's about 1,000 cases reported worldwide. And it is a debilitating illness, make patients immobile, immobile and bed bound and ultimately lead to death. And uh, the tricky thing is it's very difficult to diagnose. There's a usual delay, roughly about 2.9 years, because the symptoms are very vague. And if you are not sharp enough, it might take many, many years uh, to diagnose. And it is commonly mistaken as fondyloarthropathies due to non-specific presentation. And these tumor cells do produce high FGF23 uh, levels. And FGF23 directly affects the musculoskeletal system, uh, as well as indirectly, it causes renal hyperphosphaturia, low phosphate levels in the body, ultimately causes musculoskeletal symptoms. Now, you can see in this, in my patient, FGF23 had become normal after four weeks following the surgery. Uh, so, again, it proves the FGF23, the, um, the concentration and the musculoskeletal association. Okay, so I have tried to uh, concentrate on rare forms of uh, musculoskeletal disorders where endocrinologists uh, play a big role. And uh, correct timely diagnosis, admissed, a lot of uh, difficulties in peripheries uh, do help patients and save lives. And this is from my from the surroundings of beautiful Noorelia, and the photo courtesy goes to one of our surgeons, Dr. Bhima Jaisander. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sonali, for very interesting and very informative presentation. And uh, we understood uh, how difficult to diagnose. Uh, those cases in resource poor setting, but with your effort and uh, with the uh, whole teamwork uh, uh, you have done uh, with the, this diagnosis. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sonali, for very interesting and very informative presentation. So uh, we will take questions from online uh, participants at the end of the next presentation. The next speaker is Dr. Durga Manohari. MBBS Kalania, MD Colombo, MRCP London, overseas training in Russell's Hall Hospital, NHS Trust UK. She worked as consultant general physician, general physician in BH Kantale, Kabiti Golleva, and Paul Pitigama. Currently, she works in base hospital Tambutegama as a specialist in internal medicine. She is going to present a medical case series on prolonged fever with cytopenia. Dr. Durga. Good evening. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the Ceylon College of Physicians and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present in this forum. Today, I thought of uh, presenting three case histories of a patient with prolonged fever and cytopenia. Let me share my slides. To start with, my first patient is a 23-year-old girl 
who presented to us last month with a history of fever for 10 days with skin rash. She complained of arthralgia and myalgia, but no obvious joint swelling. Her skin rash was over her face, arms and neck, and on direct questioning, she confirmed photosensitivity. There were no other localizing symptoms or signs to suggest any systemic infection. On examination, she was febrile with a nodular erythematous skin rash over her face, neck, and arms. Especially the photosensitive was unexposed areas. She also had cervical lymphadenopathy, which was non tender and firm. No hepatosplenomegaly or any abdominal masses, and her cardiovascular, respiratory, and neurological examination was unremarkable. So we have arranged the basic investigation, which showed low hemoglobin and low normal white cell count with normal differentials and low platelet count. So her ESR was 54 with normal CRP. UFR was normal without any proteinuria or any cast. Chest X-ray was normal. Liver functions, uh, slight increase in transaminases with AST more than ALT. But serum bilirubin and ALP was within normal limits and renal functions was normal. Ultrasound abdomen was normal and MANTU test was negative. So we thought of a possible differential diagnosis with short history, possibility of infectious mononucleosis or prolonged viral fever or connective tissue disorders, mainly SLE and other infections like rickettsial cell infection was considered. So patient had ongoing fever with worsening skin rash, but no other evolving physical signs and her, she remained hemodynamically stable. So we have taken dermatology opinion, which suggests possible acute discoid lupus. So skin biopsy was arranged at the same time, cervical lymph node biopsy was done. So blood samples sent for Epstein-Barr virus serology, wheel Felix test, ANA and DSDNA. Usually we have to send these samples to either MRI or private sector, which takes nearly one week for us to get the report. So meanwhile, we were monitoring the patient closely and we have arranged serial full blood count, which showed rapidly evolving pancytopenia within five days duration. Her inflammatory markers, renal function and liver function remain unchanged. So because of pancytopenia, we have arranged the blood picture, which revealed pancytopenia without any evidence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. It has suggested that possible viral etiology, but autoimmune diseases has to be excluded in view of normal ultrasound and renal and liver function test. If persisting, bone marrow examination was suggested. So Coombs test was negative, excluding the possibility of autoimmune hemolysis and coagulation studies was normal. So on day six after admission, patient developed four episodes of generalized tonic-clonic seizures. On examination, there was no neck stiffness, no focal neurological signs, patient remained hemodynamically stable. The metabolic screening was normal, including blood sugar, serum electrolytes, and serum calcium. So we thought of a possibility of SLE with neurological involvement or any other pathology because uh, we haven't received our investigations at, at that point. So after the discussion with rheumatologist and dermatologist, we thought of managing this patient with the working diagnosis of SLE with CNS involvement because by that time she had uh, possible discoid lupus, photosensitivity, cytopenias, neurological involvement, and awaiting ANA and DSDNA reports. So four out of 11 criteria for SLE was fulfilled. So we have started her on intravenous steroids because her septic screening was negative. But we had to transfer this patient to a tertiary care center because we couldn't uh, arrange the other investigations. The patient was handed over to teaching hospital Anuradhapura. Later on, we received the skin biopsy report, which revealed lymphocytic vasculitis, 
saying SL is a possibility. And the lymph node biopsy, also necrotizing lymphadenitis, possibilities were SLE, drug reaction, and Kikuchi lymphadenitis. Then later on, the investigations requested by us were arrived. Unfortunately, ANA and DSDNA was negative, though we have managed this patient as SLE with CNS involvement. Uh, Epstein Barr virus serology was positive, suggesting recent infection. So SLE was excluded. Then our question was is it only infectious mononucleosis or some other pathology? Patient had fever, cervical lymphadenopathy, skin rash, seizures, and cytopenia, which of course can be there in infectious nucleosis, infectious mononucleosis. But regarding cytopenia, most commonly in infectious mononucleosis, we get autoimmune hemolytic anemia, so or autoimmune cytopenias. But in this patient, Coombs test was negative. So further investigation was arranged in uh, TH Hanuradhapura, which revealed high serum ferritin, high serum triglyceride level with high LDH. So bone marrow biopsy was arranged. But uh, they had to wait for one week because this patient was started on steroid initially. So after one week, bone marrow biopsy was arranged, which confirmed the histologic evidence of hemophagocytosis without any abnormal cell infiltrate. So the diagnosis of hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis or HLH secondary to Epstein-Barr virus infection was made. In view of fever, rapidly evolving cytopenia, high serum triglyceride level, serum ferritin level was high, and histologic evidence of hemophagocytosis. So patient was managed with corticosteroids and supportive management with complete remission. So I thought of uh, presenting two other case histories which I have come across during my, my previous appointments. So, Case two, it's a 21-year-old university student presented to us with a history of fever for four days with skin rash. Patient initially had myalgia with low-grade fever for three days, and on day two, he has developed vesicular rash, which was diagnosed as chicken fox or varicella infection from the OPD and started on acyclovir. Fever settled after 24 hours and patient was feeling well. Then patient started fever again on day 10 with abdominal pain and vomiting, but no other localizing symptoms. So on examination on admission, patient was febrile and ill-looking. Patient had generalized skin rash, which confirmed to be due to previous uh, chickenpox infection. Cervical and inguinal lymph nodes were enlarged, which was non-tender and firm. Abdominal examination revealed splenomegaly, but no hepatomegaly or any other masses, but tenderness over right hypochondrial area was noted. Again, cardiovascular, respiratory, and neurological examination was unremarkable. So investigation suggests severe pancytopenia with ESR of 32 and CRP of 12. His septic screening was negative. And liver function test showed increased transaminases with AST more than ALT with high alkaline phosphatase and direct hyperbilirubinemia. Renal functions were normal as well as the protein profile. But blood picture confirmed the fan cytopenia without any atypical cells and without any evidence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So in view of we arranged liver function test. The viral hepatitis screening was done, which was negative for hepatitis A, B, and C. The HIV screening, Epstein-Barr virus serology was negative. ANA negative, excluding the possibility of some autoimmune conditions. And because pancreatitis was associated closely with the chickenpox, we have arranged serum amylase, which was within normal limit. So what? could be the diagnosis. This patient is having fever, splenomegaly, lymph node enlargement, cytopenia with dearranged liver function. Again, the possibility of HLH was considered. 
then serum triglyceride level was high very high serum ferritin level and bone marrow biopsy showed increased hemophagocytic activity then the diagnosis was hlh secondary to varicella zoster infection this patient was also managed with corticosteroids and supportive treatment patient was started on intravenous dexamethasone fever settled within 3 days and liver function improved over a period of 2 weeks so i will move to my third case history she is a 59 year old patient presented with a history of fever for 3 months duration initially she had very low grade fever but 2 weeks prior to the admission she had experienced high grade fever with chills it was associated with documented weight loss and anorexia she also complained of exertional dyspnea which worsened gradually but she denied any symptoms of uh, any systemic infection and there were no close contacts with pets and no recent travel on examination she was febrile on admission she was pale and icteric but no clubbing no other peripheral stigma of infective endocarditis or skin rashes abdominal examination revealed splenomegaly but no other palpable masses or hepatomegaly again respiratory cardiovascular and neurological examination was normal so basic investigation revealed bicytopenia with low hemoglobin normochromic normocytic pattern with normal white cell count and low normal platelet count with within one week patient de developed rapid decrease in platelet count with decrease in hemoglobin but white cells remain normal inflammatory markers esr was high 130 crp 45 again liver function her transaminases were within normal limits but alkaline phosphatase was very high with direct hyperbilirubinemia again serum protein was normal with normal renal function so septic screening was negative and in view of uh, dearranged liver function hepatitis screening was done which was negative hiv screening negative epstein bar virus and mycoplasma antibody test were negative na was negative and man2 test was negative excluding the pos some possibility of connective tissue disorders and other possible infections so ultrasound abdomen was arranged and it showed normal liver normal spleen no parietic lymph nodes and no other but there was a uh, hypoechoic mass in left adenexia we thought of a possibility of uh, ovarian malignancy but ca125 was within normal limit but still contrast and has abdomen c uh, contrast and said ct abdomen was arranged which showed enlarged spleen normal size liver but multiple low attenuation non enhancing lesions are noted in the liver and spleen with multiple enlarged parietic lymph nodes the previously noted mass in left adenexia in ultrasound was confirmed to be a lymph node mass so basically patient is having intraabdominal lymphadenopathy with enlarged spleen and liver and splenic lesion so blood picture again confirmed bicytopenia but evidence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia was noted and bone marrow examination was suggested protein profile was dearranged with raised d dimers confirming the possibility of disseminated intravascular coagulation so bone marrow biopsy was arranged as suggested by the blood picture in so ultimately the report confirmed the possibility of hemophagocytosis without any evidence of non hemopoietic cell infiltrates so again the investigations continued to exclude the possibility of hlh which confirmed high triglyceride 
very high serum ferritin, about 20,000, and high LDH. So this patient is having fever, bicytopenia, lymphadenopathy, hepatic and splenic involvement, DIC, and histologic evidence of phagocytosis, hypertriglyceridemia, high serum peritin, and increased LDH. So HLH secondary to possible lymphoma or other malignancy was suspected. And laparoscopic lymph node biopsy was planned for the diagnosis of possible malignant process and patient was started on intravenous steroids because patient was unstable by that time. We had to admit this patient to ICU with multi-organ failure and DIC, but unfortunately, within a few days, patient deteriorated and we couldn't save this patient. So to summarize my three cases, all three patients had fever, cytopenia, and lymph node enlargement. Liver enlargement, liver involvement in two cases. And ca uh, first case, skin involvement and neurological symptoms. Jaundice in case two and case three, splenomegaly. First, first patient, Epstein Barr virus infection was confirmed. Second patient, varicella zoster infection. Third patient, possibility of malignancy or lymphoma was suspected. Unfortunately, we couldn't confirm it. So all three patients ultimately ended up with the diagnosis of HLH. So HLH, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. To discuss a few things about HLH, it is a life-threatening hematological disorder. The diagnosis of HLH is challenging to establish because of its variable presentation and most of the time, the clinical features from the triggering factor predominates. So it will mask the signs of HLH, so delaying the diagnosis. Considering the pathophysiology in HLH, there is severe immune system dysregulation with dysfunction of natural killer cells and T cells, the antigen presenting cell activity, ultimately producing cytokine storm. These cytokines will stimulate macrophages leading to hemophagocytosis in bone marrow. So the red cells, white cells, platelet and their precursors will reduce in number causing cytopenia. This condition can be inherited or secondary. The inherited or familial form present as autosomal recessive or X-linked recessive disorder. It is restricted to children and they present more than 80% patients present before the age of one year. In secondary LH, it can be seen in all age groups without any gender preference. The possible component of genetic predisposition is identified in some patients due to the finding of heterozygous mutations. The secondary HLH occurs due to the immune system stimulation by some triggering factors like infections, autoimmune conditions, malignancies, and immunosuppression. Infections triggering HLH can be either virus, bacteria, parasites, or fungi. The Epstein-Barr virus is the most commonly identified virus to cause HLH, but cytomegalovirus, varicella zoster virus, HIV infection, herpes so simplex, and measles have been identified. The bacteria such as brucella, tuberculosis, and some gram-negative bacteria, parasites like Leishmania, malaria, and Kala Asa, identified as most some uh, association with HLH. Considering the autoimmune disorders, SLE, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, the juvenile Kawasaki disease is identified with HLH. So when secondary HLH present in association with autoimmune mm -hmm. disorders, special term macrophage activation syndrome was given because this group of patients are considered separately the treatment of mass or the HLH secondary to autoimmune disorders is different from the recommended treatment for some other forms of secondary HLH. 
This is a life-threatening traumatological disorder which need urgent treatment. So malignancies, leukemias and lymphomas are most related, commonly AML and Hodgkin's lymphoma are identified. So immunosuppression or organ transplant after post-chemotherapy, uh, renal and liver transplant, immune su suppressive treatment have been identified as trigger factors for secondary HLH. Some evidence are there to suggest association of HLH with the use of lamotrigine, the anti-epileptic drug. So what are the clinical features of HLH? It is fever, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, lymphadenopathy, jaundice, skin rash, most commonly maculopapular, but sometimes nodular eruptions can be seen. And central nervous system manifestations like encephalopathy, meningism, ataxia, cranial nerve falsies and seizures due to lymphocytic infiltration of nervous system have been identified. So laboratory abnormalities, cytopenia occurs in almost all patients, hyperbilirubinemia, high LDH, high triglyceride level, elevation of serum ferritin, it can be in uh, about 2000 for the diagnosis and serum fibrinogen, typically low and DIC. So how to diagnose HLH? Currently we use HLH 2004 diagnostic criteria to diagnose HLH. To get a more clear view of the diagnostic criteria, HLH can be diagnosed if a molecular diagnosis consistent with HLH established with genetic studies or otherwise we have to find five out of eight diagnostic criteria for HLH. Those eight HLH criteria are fever more than seven days, splenomegaly, cytopenias affecting two or more three cell lineage of peripheral blood, Hemoglobin should be less than nine, platelet 100,000 and WWC 1,000. Hypertriglyceridemia and or reduced fibrinogen level. Or histologic evidence of hemophagocytosis in bone marrow, spleen or lymph nodes. Low or undetected natural killer cell activity, ferrit high ferritin level or CD25 level more than 2400. Those are the diagnostic criteria. So we have to full it, uh, to diagnose HLH, either molecular diagnosis or five out of eight diagnostic criteria has to be fulfilled. So histologic diagnosis of hemophagocytosis. Hemophagocytic activity can be seen in bone marrow, spleen, liver, enlarged lymph nodes and cerebrospinal fluid. But demonstrating hemophagocytic activity in these tissues per se is not sensitive enough to diagnose hemophagocytosis because hemophagocytic activity can be seen in sepsis, myelodysplastic syndrome, after blood transfusion, hemopoietic stem cell transplant and post-chemotherapy. So with hemophagocytic activity, other criteria has to be fulfilled. So other features supporting HLH diagnosis that are not part in HLH 2004 criteria include high serum bilirubin level, hepatomegaly, transaminitis, which is present in vast majority of patients with HLH, elevated LDH and raised D-dimer levels. D-dimer level can be raised even when INR, APTT and fibrinogen levels normal. So how to treat HLH? It has two arms, immediate treatment and long-term treatment. Immediate treatment aims in suppressing the severe inflammation or destroying the overstimulated antigen presenting cells, treating the triggering agent and supportive treatment. To suppress the inflammation, corticosteroids is considered. Dexamethasone is preferred due to its ability to cross blood-brain barrier. 
but when we consider the mass or the secondary hlh associated with autoimmune conditions methylprednisolone is preferred and we can use cyclosporine a and intrathecal methotrexate or hydrocortisone in patients with persistent cns disease after 2 weeks of treatment to destroy the overstimulated antigen presenting cells chemotherapeutic agent etoposide is used so the triggering agent should be treated with antibiotics or antiviral a supportive treatment with hydration and nutrition gastroprotection careful monitoring for secondary infections because we are using steroids and uh, immunosuppressive drugs and prophylactic for trimethazole should be considered the role of intravenous immunoglobulin in the treatment of hlh is not very clear there are no strong evidence to suggest Uh, any rem remission after intravenous immunoglobulin in all patients with hlh but in patients with underlying immune dysfunction the in star, uh, intravenous immunoglobulin has shown some remission acyclovir does not appear to be useful in treatment treatment of epstein barr virus associated hlh but uh, Uh, hlh associated with other viral pathogens the antiviral chemotherapy has been reported to induce remission so long term treatment allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant is the curative treatment bone marrow transplantation should be considered if remission is not attained by 8 weeks of chemotherapy and immunotherapy so this is the summary of uh, the management path which i have discussed already so thank you that's all informative presentation uh, now we are coming to the q and a session uh Yes, we have one question in Q and A box. Questions goes to Dr. Durga. Dr. Durga, in your case one, how did you explain discoid lupus? Uh, could it have been macrophage activation syndrome secondary to SLE? Any negative SLE? Yes, it is a possibility, but uh, patients ANA was negative. double stranded dna was negative complements within normal limit and all the other anti nuclear auto antibody profile was negative okay so but epstein barr virus serology was positive so we thought of sl is less likely and it is a imn induced secondary hlh but initially we were misled by the clinical presentation and the skin rash but ultimately Uh, turned out to be imn associated hlh thank you dr durga and may i ask a question from dr sonali dr sonali uh, when we do vitamin d level from our patients uh, we have seen a lot of kms uh, vitamin d levels are low in our country and that is uh, one of little bit my experience and is it very common uh, findings in our population and what is the common cause yeah actually um clinically even i find it uh, surprising a lot of reports that we get uh, show that uh, patients are vitamin d deficient yes so there are a few explanations one is um, now we have not validated all these cutoffs for sri lankan population mm -hmm. so ideally if we are to do that then we need to do calcium phosphorus and pth levels as well as urine calcium excretion and all those profile together with vitamin d and then validate the norms for sri lankan population so that is something which is deficient in our society and our medical field which needs to be addressed quite uh, soon i guess and because of that 
we can't i can't tell a exact answer because we don't have any published data or validated results the second thing is um, now we know we are a tropical country but still how many of us do go out and uh, stay in the sun that is the main source of vitamin d production in and uh, vitamin d um, to our body so i myself would not do that so uh, so likewise most of us do not get that much of sun exposure uh, to get enough vitamin d as well so yeah. and that is the main source if we take food the amount of vitamin d we get from the food is uh, not that great as uh, sun exposure so many factors do contribute and we see a lot of uh, reports with vitamin d deficiency now it had become a trend also but unfortunately we don't have enough data to comment on that but we just have to believe the report and uh, believe the rangers until we kind of uh, validate our our values sri lankan values um, scientifically thank you very much dr uh, very much for that answer and uh, now we have come to the end of the sessions today uh, first let me to thank uh, two speakers today dr sonali and dr durga for very very informative and ex excellent presentations and also i would like to thank uh, uh, all online participants for joining with us and let me to thank ccp staff av team mr nalina and sponsors merk pharmaceuticals for their valuable support thank you Thank you.